Hello learners, hope you are doing well. So this is the revision video for your quiz 3. So this consists of uh, the lectures from week 7 to 9, the all the portions in that week. So let's start. So we started with graphs. So what is a graph? It's basically a structure that is amounting to a set of real objects. So uh, the definitions and everything can be read in the PDF. Um, but what I want to, what I want the learners to understand is what are graphs? What, what do we mean by graphs and uh, what do they represent? So we have two types of graphs. We have a directed graph in which uh, the edges, they, their orientation, whether they're moving from left to right or right to left, and uh, the orientation of the nodes uh, with respect to the position on the edge of the node, of the edge of the graph, um, all uh, has its own meaning. But in the case of undirected graphs, uh, we know that there is no such meaning for these graphs and uh, it just uh, shows that there is a connection between say node A and node B. So uh, that is what undirected graphs are and directed graphs have certain meaning say um, you make a graph where i scores more than j. So in that case there is a node i and the direction of it would be from i to j. But uh, say if there is something else where you want to see if two authors have co-authored a book and in that case you see there is an i and a j but there is no direction as such it's just a plain connection between those two so there is no direction because if i has co-authored with j so it automatically means that j has also co-authored a book with i so that is an example of an undirected graph whereas a directed graph could be in this case of say i scores more than j so uh, that's basically the literature regarding graphs there is nothing more there's nothing very complicated on graphs um, there is a subset of graphs which is a clique so what are cliques uh, it is a subset of a graph and mind you this are, these are undirected graphs these cannot uh, cliques we cannot form in directed graphs we can form them in undirected graph where all the nodes are connected by an by edges with each other node. So say we have a graph here and um, you can see that there is only one clique here that is this because we will see that each and every element in this particular clique or in this particular group in fact is connected to each of the other, other nodes. So what does this represent? It represents a clique. So cliques are very useful when you want to group a pair of say students who can um, help each other or students that can form a study group. So we know that each student has something to offer to some other student. So in that case cliques can be very necessary. So this is basically all that is there from week 7 uh, and that was about graphs and cliques so let's just move on to some questions and these are the mock questions so the question here is that a chess tournament is conducted for n players and each player plays every other player d times the result of each match is either a win or a draw the results are stored in a list called chess and each match where player i beats j is recorded as a list and note that this list is a pair of i and j and uh, it's uh, in this uh, list called chess so it's uh, so chess is basically a list of lists so the information about draws are not recorded for example suppose let n be equal to 3 that means we are taking three players 1 2 and 3 and let d be 3 so each pair so in these three people so we take the pair so each pair plays three times so say one and two will play three games 
2 and 3 will play 3 games and uh, 1 and 3 will also play 3 games. So the list, an, ex an example of a list is given below. So we see that here in the first, this is a list of lists and the first element is a list which contains 1 and 2. So this means that 1 has beaten 2 in a game. Then the next element is 2, 1, which means that 2 has beaten 1 in the second game. And notice that there is no third element that has this 1, 2 or 2, 1 pair, which means that that match probably ended in a draw. So the next we go is to 2 and 3, the pair 2, 3. So here you see the third element is 2, comma 3 and the fourth element is 3 1 and you can see the other elements so uh, you can see a pattern here that the first element is the player that won and the second element is the player that lost now here we see that player 1 and player 2 have beaten each other once so the third match that they played must have been a draw so it's a very valid conclusion a very valid um, expectation so this is the first question in the mock test. So it states that the following pseudocode generates a graph G from chess. Each node corresponds to a player. There is an edge from player I to J if player I has beaten player J at least once. So we know that what at least is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so uh, player J at least, okay, uh, each edge is associated with a table T that denotes player I has beaten player J T number of times in the tournament. So what we have to do is we have to choose the correct code fragment to complete the following pseudo code. So all that we have been given is we create a matrix with N rows and N columns and we know that N is the number of players that are playing and that is created in this variable called m. So the first option is that uh, for each l in chess, we take i as the last element of l. So already we see that we have failed it because we know that it is always i j. Uh, at least in this question is given as i j. So i is always the first element of the list. j is the last element. So that is how this is supposed to be taken. This is the first element and this is the last element. So this is already failed here. In the second option, we see that for each L in chess, we take I as the first element of L, J as the last element of L. And we see that whenever we come across such a list, we increment, increment the value at position m i j by 1 so which means it is the ith row and the jth column in the matrix so you have a matrix here and uh, l goes through all the lists so you know that at each iteration l will take one list and i will take the first element of that particular list l and j will take the second element or the last element in this case of that particular list L in that particular iteration. So at the ith row and the jth column we see that since i has won the game we put a 1 here and uh, if i has won the second game too we increment this by 1 so it becomes 2. If it has won all 3 games or if it wins the third game depending on uh, how many games they play then they can increment by 1 and so on. So this process keeps happening until we run out of games uh, that we can see in the list and we stop. So we see that already we have reached a correct answer because this satisfies all our criteria. But uh, just for the purpose of revision, let's go ahead and see why the other two options are wrong. We see that for each L in chess, we have taken I as the first element and J as the last element of that list L. But here we see that we are creating something of an undirected draft because we see here that this was a directed draft because only if i has beaten j do we increment 
the value of m i j by 1 which means that is the direct graph but here we see that since we are incrementing in both positions i j and j i it becomes an undirected graph so it just forms a connection between i and j and there is no real direction to this graph so this that is where this option fails and in your last option you see that for each l in chess we take the first element as i and the last element of l as j but here what we do is we have assigned 1 to m i j which means uh, it's equal to saying that no matter how many times i has beaten j the value at m i j is always going to be 1 so that is not the objective of this question so hence our, this option also fails so we see that the correct answer is option number 2 so learners can read out um, you can read out the explanation here which is given in words so moving on to the next question in this question we have a procedure called special vertex which takes two parameters which is an, a matrix M and uh, an element i so this i would represent the player index now we iterate through the columns of j uh, pardon me we iterate as j through the columns of the matrix m um, and we see that if m i j is equal to 0 then we return false so again just a recap that whenever uh, the player i beats j we increment the value at that position by 1 so we increment it by 1 so each time that i beats j so initially if it was a 0 and we see the first time that i beat j in a chess match we automatically increment this by 1 the element at this position so what does m i j equal to 0 mean it means that i was not able to beat j even once throughout the uh, set of matches that they've played so in that case we return a false and if there are no elements that is if i has beaten all of j so please note that here i is fixed because we are only iterating through j the columns of j and we have already fixed i here so what we want to check is that is there any opponent to i that um, i could not beat so basically if I was a player say 0 so let's take again from the last example let's take 1 2 3 okay and we see that there was a list of lists so let's take 1 2 2 1 and 2 3 3 1 3 2 3, 1 and another 3, 1. So from this example, we get to know that once we put this special vertex, and we take the matrix M and the opponent, uh, pardon me, the player as 3, and we iterate through three's opponents what we come to know that three has lost only once so in that case even though three has had a magnificent record it still lost one match that is against two so in that case it would return false in one of the iterations say even in this match pardon me yes even in this match it was a 3-2 so in this case we would see that 3 was completely unbeaten throughout its matches and it would never return 0 or never return false and once the entire iteration it iterates through all the columns of 3 we find out that it returns a true so which means that 3 has beaten every other player so the question is when will the procedure vertex 
a special vertex m comma i returns true so we know that from from what we understand of how this procedure works that it returns true only when i has beaten every other player so which means there is not going to be even one zero throughout the entire list so it is to be noted that we do not consider 3 comma 3 because that is anyway going to be 0 so they should have actually have been something like i not equal to j but that's uh, that's another discussion but from what has been given here it is clear that special vertex which takes two parameters the matrix and i that is the player that we want to search uh, it will only return true when i has beaten every other player so with that let's move forward so here it's been given that the following three questions are based on the scores table uh, so it should be noted here learners that our objective of today's revision is not to simply solve the mock test but to gain a deeper understanding of what has been taught in the past three weeks so here i will not be solving all the questions but i would like to just solve a few questions and to clear your doubts so i would request the learners to post all your doubts in the comment section so that uh, the team can get to get with you and um, solve your doubts and i will also be helping i'll also be assisting the team with the problem solving so i urge all the learners to post your doubts in the comment section uh, with that let's move forward uh, let n be the number of rows in the scores table an adjacency matrix m is constructed to represent a graph g using the following pseudo code so you see that uh, we have the standard uh, definition to call i mean to create a matrix called create matrix that takes n rows and n columns then we iterate through each row and column and we assign an empty list to each element of that matrix so in this matrix it's just going to be an empty list at each position so that's how it's going to look like at the end of execution now we take a list and assign it to this variable l and in this list we have three strings uh, each is one subject that is uh, chemistry mathematics and physics respectively and then we go through this table one and we read the first row and uh, mind you that this table is actually the scores table so we first read x we then we move that x to table two so which means that now we have one row which is assigned to x so that is say one row now again we move to table one and we read the first row y so y is basically the first row after x had been moved so initially say in this couple of rows you had n number of rows now this first row was x it was moved to table two so now you have n minus one rows and now your first row is y and that is also moved to table 2 or is it no it is moved to table 3 pardon me it's actually moved to table 3 so what do we want to find out now we iterate through this list l and the iterator is now called subject so it makes sense here why because we are iterating through this list l that contains the name of the subject so we give a suitable name it's not necessary that it has to be subject you could give it any other name but for ease of understanding it has been given as subject here so now we go through this if statement we see that if x dot subject is greater than y dot subject so which means that we compare the chemistry mathematics and physics marks of both x and y in each iteration of L and then we check if the student X scored higher than student Y in a particular subject then at the 
position of the matrix that corresponds to the sequence number of x and sequence number of y. So a graph might help here. So it would basically look something like this. So if x scored more than y, so it's a directed graph that is directing x to y. So it would be at say a matrix and at this x row and y column we would let's see what we would do we are appending the name of the subject so this is the standard operation to append to a list and to this list we just append the name of the subject say if it's chemistry we would just do we should just append chemistry if it's physics we would just append the string physics and so on um, but we see that if this statement does not suffice we go into this if statement and we check if the if y has scored more than x in that particular subject then at position y x so which means that in this case y is directed to x so in this case what do we do at the position y x that means in the y row and the x column we append the subject name whatever is the subject name to that list at that particular element once everything is done then we move all the rows from table 3 to table 1 so as we know that all x's which means all alternate rows of this table 1 will move to table 2 and the others were moved to table 3 so now again we move all the table 3 back to table 1 so that in the next iteration of this while loop we can compare all the rows that were left out and we can do another sort of comparison so in this way we can compare all our rows with each other rows so it becomes a very exhaustive uh, process so now comes the question so the first question is uh, for each pair of vertices i and j and here it's explicitly given that i is not equal to j because you're not comparing a student with themselves uh, choose the correct statement about m i j so let's see what the first statement says it says that m i j is a list of subjects in which i scores more than j okay so we have got our correct answer in the first option itself so how is that so we know that if x has scored higher in a subject than y then at position say m x comma y so this is basically the sequence number and the sequence number so if student uh, say with sequence number two scored greater than student with sequence number five then at position m two 5 which means that in the matrix the row number 2 and the column number 5 will have the subject in which 2 scored greater than 5 so if we substitute it basically i scored greater than j so that subject is what is present so what does the option say m i j is a list of subjects so it could be more than one subject so it could be maybe math and physics so this could be those two subjects in which uh, two scored greater than five so yes that is definitely an answer so basically m i just list of subjects in which i scores more than j so this is your correct answer uh, let's just go forward with the other options to see why it is wrong so here it says that m i j is the number of subjects so we know that we were appending to a list so we were not just counting okay um, if 2 has scored greater than 5 at uh, 2 5 we are giving the number 2 no this is not the case we are actually appending to a list the string elements the string elements which were the subject names that were being appended to the string uh, pardon me to this list and that is the that is the list that is uh, seen at 2 comma 5 at positions 2 5 so now we know why this has failed now the next option is mij is a list of subjects in which i scores less than j so again no because again 
it is clearly stated that only if x scores greater than y do we append it to x y so the x row and the y column so let there be two students i and j and let i score more marks than j say i scored two more marks than j so where are we appending we are appending the subject name at the position m i j that means there is a very very prominent direction from i to j it is a directed graph so in that case we know that i has scored more than j so it's not the other way around where i has scored less than j it is only where i has scored more than j do we append the subject names at positions in the ith row and the jth column so again this has failed now again in the last option we see that it is number of subjects and less so this has failed both our criteria so automatically this is also wrong so i think that is the end for graphs let's uh, move forward with the next topic so coming to recursion uh, this learners is a very very important topic in the sense that it could really make or break a code so it could make a really beautiful code or it could just break your system and uh, run an infinite loop if it was uh, made in a wrong way or it was not given the correct set of procedures so let's just go through the first line of the definition so recursion is the process a procedure goes through when one of the steps of the procedure involves invoking the procedure itself so you, you guys have seen this you guys have seen this in your graded assignments you have seen this in the lectures that you have a procedure and you would like to say move from one station to another but you don't want to write a long piece of code a while loop and then it just goes through each of the list in the table so it gets really hectic so what learners would like to do is you would like to make a recursive procedure that goes to one station checks if it has reached the destination if not we again call the procedure to take you to the next station and again go and check the condition if you have reached your destination if not you keep on taking you keep on say hopping on and hopping off until you reach your desired destination and instead of writing a long while loop that goes through each and every possibility you write a recursive procedure that acts smartly and just goes through itself until it has reached its destination so procedure that goes through the recursion is said to be recursive so this concept is very sensitive and uh, i think it would be best explained by solving a few problems so let's just go into a problem so here is given that consider the procedure calculate given below the procedure takes two positive integers as arguments and returns an integer so you see there are two positive integers so i would explain why they are taking two positive integers after I explain the question so you see that if i is equal to equal to 0 we return j so that means a positive integer you give it say above 0 otherwise in the first iteration itself it would just return j so you give a positive integer above i and if this condition is not met then we again call this procedure but this time we tweak it a bit by reducing the value of i by 1 and increasing the value of i uh, pardon me increasing the value of j by the value of i before it was decremented before i was decremented by 1 we take that value and we increment j so let me just explain to you with this question what does calculate which takes two parameters 3 and 2 return 
so you see that in the first first iteration you take uh, calculate and you take 3 comma 2 now what happens so it first goes and checks if i was equal to 0 and we know that here it's i comma j so your first element is always the i and second element is j so it sees if 3 is equal to equal to 0 obviously not so now it returns this value calculate but with 3 minus 1 and 3 plus 2 so how is that so it just takes calculate um, and it reduces the value of 3 by 1 which makes it 2 and it increases the value of 2 by the value of i which is 3 so it becomes 2 plus 3 that is 5 now again it goes through this loop so it's a reminder to learners that in each of this return statement we are again going through the same loop that we went through here we again go through the same loop if we don't meet the condition we go through the same loop again if we don't meet the condition we again go through the same loop and it's a it's a procedure that calls itself so you understand so until we reach a condition where this portion becomes true if this portion becomes true then you can return the value of j uh, the num by number of times it was incremented so you can understand you, i guess the learners are trying to grasp this concept so let me just move forward now we see if the value of i is equal to 0 that is 2 so it's not equal to 0 we again call calculate we again call the value of calculate now what do we do, do this time again we decrement the value of 2 it becomes 1 and we increment the value of 5 by the num by the amount of i that is 5 plus 2 which is 7 again we go through this loop we check if i is equal to equal to 0 since it is not we again go through this loop we again call the recursive function I have forgotten the spelling of calculate it seems sorry about that yeah now what do we do we decrement 1 so it has become 0 this time but we increment 7 by the value of i that is by 1 becomes 8 now after this loop it goes and checks if i is equal to equal to 0 and here this is your i so finally we see that i has been returned as 0 this statement is true we can finally enter this if statement and we can return j finally we have a return so it is starting to look like a long procedure but suddenly in four steps we have seen that i was equal to 0 and then we return j so what is j in this case j is 8 because that is where we have to check for the return value what was the return value in the final iteration when the if statement became true so that is where we return j so in this case j is equal to 8 so slowly that j comes back here it goes back here and finally it is returned here so why why am i going step by step is because there was always this return calculate so whatever value was given here we have to return it back to this procedure so in that case we see that the final answer here is supposed to be 8 so it took some time it took some time but finally this recursive procedure ended itself now let's come to why is it said that two positive integers now say we took calculate we just took this as calculate minus 1 comma uh, say 5 so you see that this procedure would never become 0 because we are always subtracting 1 from i we are always subtracting 1 from i so there is 
it's always going to be a smaller negative number in each iteration uh, in each iteration and it would just keep on going it will become an infinite loop and um, if your systems are a bit uh, older or an older version of your system it would overheat very quickly your system might crash so it would just be an infinite loop that keeps on running so to avoid this we should always take precautions when we create recursive functions we should always be careful uh, as to what conditions that we're giving as to if there is a condition where we can terminate this recursive function and not to create an infinite loop so with that we know that now the answer to this function is 8 so now let's move on to the next question so this question states that which of the following is the output returned by calculate x comma y so this is a really interesting question why because here we don't have a number we are just supposed to uh, we're supposed to use the logic that we have gained from using recursive functions and it really requires us to use all the knowledge that we've gained in the past few classes so let's let's just do uh, let's just try to find this out manually okay so we have something called calculate x y and it keeps on checking if this particular x when it becomes zero at that point we return the updated value of y so please understand that we are returning the updated value of y so always the not always but in this question the output returned would be an updated value of y so all that we need to concern ourselves with is what would be that value so let's run the first iteration uh, i don't want to call it an iteration let's just go to the first step so iteration might uh, confuse the learners with a loop a traditional for each loop or a while loop but this is a bit different from that so in the first step we see that it is x minus 1 and what is what do we add to x we add to x uh, we add to y x so that's what happened in the first type uh, first uh, step in fact and uh, what happens next next we check if this x minus 1 is equal to 0 so if it is not equal to 0 we again run this for another step and this time x is subtracted by 2 why because it is x minus 1 minus 1 so it would become a minus 2 so it is just an x minus 1 and minus 1 so that would become minus 2 and what would happen to this particular value so this is still y plus x because the previous updated value was y plus x this time what do we add we add the value of x before it was decremented from the previous step so now it becomes x minus 1 so now this is the updated value of y in the second step so let this be step 1 now this is step 2 now we again check if x minus 2 is equal to 0 if x minus 2 is not equal to 0 now we go to step 3 then we again calculate we again calculate to see if this becomes 0 in the next one but first we have to decrement the value of x here so this becomes x minus 3 and what does y become now the updated value we have to write first so this is the updated value from the previous step now it has to add to it the previous value of x which was in this case x minus 2 so you see y is incremented till the time till the time we 
know that this x becomes 0. Only when x becomes 0 do we have an end to this recursive function. So once that recursive function reaches its minimum, we know that the value that is returned is going to be y plus x plus say x minus 1 plus x minus 2. So at one point there would come a time when your x becomes 1. So it would be in the previous step it would be a 2 minus 1 it will become 1 comma say some value of 5 and then in the last step what would happen is this 1 would again be checked if it is equal to 0 since it is not equal to 0 we would decrement this value of 1 it becomes a 0 we increment 5 by this value it becomes a 6 and finally what we have is uh, the ending the ending of this recursive function so in that case we would also add a zero in the last step we would add a zero in the last step but since this is not counted because anything plus zero is that value so that's not counted so what would happen is we would get this particular value at the end of execution of calculate xy. So from these options we can see that the third option is what is closest to what we know. So this is what we know that the original value of y was updated in every step until the value of x reaches 0. Beyond that there is no more incrementing, there is no more uh, recursion. It terminates there and it returns the value of j or the second element which in this case is a y. So this is what our calculate function returns. So with this we have come to the end of the revision lecture. I would suggest learners to use Google to use all the resources that is available on the net because computational thinking is a really it's not a tough topic but it does get a little difficult to understand there is not much to explain all that you have to do is practice more sums i would suggest all learners to do the mock test try it on their own uh, try to do it within the time limit that is the 45 minute time limit that iitm has given and also do register uh, do uh, go through the solutions that has been given there because uh, it's better to further your understanding in this particular subject because in the next term you would have to go with python programming so you should have your concepts in computational thinking um, it should be quite clear so with that i wish all the learners all the best for your quiz and um, thank you learners